I'm Alex Guarnaschelli, and you're listening to Beyond the Plate with Cappy. For me, I knew my profession had to be my hobby. People are always talking about passion. That's another word. Like, I'm going to take passion and balance, and I'm going to table them for five years. Because I think you get passionate when you get good. Hey everyone, this is Kathy and you're listening to Beyond the Plate, a podcast where I sit down in person with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey into the industry and the social impact they have made in their community. Every episode, we share inspiring stories of what it means to be in today's hospitality industry. This episode was recorded live from the 17th Annual Food Network and Cooking Channel South Beach Wine and Food Festival. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Sir Kensington's Condiments. Sir Kensington's is on a mission to bring integrity and charm to ordinary and overlooked food. If you know me, you know I love Sir Kensington's. Their award-winning portfolio o condiments includes ketchups, mayos, mustards, and an eggless mayo product called Fabinez. Also, as I have previously mentioned, a soon-to-come line of ranch dressings. You want to know my favorites? I thought you'd never ask. Under the mayo umbrella of Sir Kensington's, they sell a jarred product called Special Sauce. Most people, I'm guessing, may use this on a burger. Can I give you my two cents? Try this on an egg sandwich at home. It is delicious. Also, if you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen that I bought a jalapeno bratwurst at a store, and I thought that was gonna be the focus of my meal, but it actually wound up being like the side item because my plate soon was four dipping sauces from Sir Kensington's. I dipped this thing in their sriracha mayo, which is awesome. Little bit of spice, that sriracha flavor. I dipped it in their chipotle mayo, which had like a really subtle, delicious spice with a little tang in there. I also dipped in their spicy brown mustard, which was great, not too spicy, even though I could take the heat, and their jalapeno ketchup. Just realizing these are four spicy sauces that I dipped them in, but I'm a spice fan. If you are too, check out these products. To learn more about Sir Kensington's, please visit sirkensingtons.com or visit them on the social media platforms at Sir Kensington's. Sir Kensington's, we thank you. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Aisle 8 by Flavor Gallery. Flavor Gallery is one of the leading culinary apparel designers and manufacturers of food, chef, restaurant, hospitality-related brands. Aisle 8 is a subsidiary food-themed line under Flavor Gallery. Aisle 8 by Flavor Gallery supplied all of our signature hats and t-shirts to our Beyond the Plate guests. I will keep teasing this, but these will be coming to the Aisle 8 by Flavor Gallery website soon. Aisle 8 by Flavor Gallery, we thank you. Okay, back to it. For this episode, we sat with Chef Alex Guarnaschali. Here's the story. Alex wanted to do this interview down in Miami super early in the morning. I'm not a morning person, but I budged because I know I wanted to talk to her because she's an awesome person. (laughs) What happened was this was scheduled for a Saturday morning. The Friday night before was the Burger Bash down at the South Beach Wine and Food Festival. And as I was walking around the Burger Bash, I see Alex outside of her booth giving away her burger. There's probably like two, 3,000 plus people there. It was really loud. And in my head, I'm like, oh, great. She's going to have zero voice tomorrow. Flash forward a couple hours. Alex winds up winning one of the awards to the Burger Bash. Flash forward 30 minutes after that, I see her pulling away on a golf cart with Guy Fieri and his team and her team. I knew this was a potential recipe for voice disaster the next morning. Sure enough, Alex shows up on time. She was all good to her word. And she started to say hi to us from a distance, but I wasn't hearing her voice. And it was nearly gone. It was actually pretty funny. It was a little raspy. You'll hear it. She jokes that it sounded a little Rachel Ray-esque, which was pretty funny. Anyway, Alex was an awesome person to talk to. She's the real deal. She grew up in a family where her mother was a cookbook editor. She's worked in France. She was a sous chef under Guy Savoie, famous French chef restaurant. She was a young female running an all-male French chef kitchen, which we talk about, which is really interesting. She talks about things like balance, being on TV, being the chef of a restaurant, highs, lows, all great things we love to talk about during this podcast. And last but certainly not least, social impact and how she gives back to her community. 
Alex is a recurring judge on several Food Network primetime series, such as Chopped, Cooks vs. Cons, and Bakers vs. Fakers. In 2012, she beat nine rival chefs to win the next Iron Chef Redemption and joined the ranks of Kitchen Stadium Iron Chefs. In 2003, she became the chef of Butter Restaurant in New York City. She worked for Larry Forgione, Danielle Balud in New York, Joaquin Splicall. She is a cookbook author herself. I'm going to stop here, but please enjoy this conversation as we go beyond the plate with Chef Alex Warnashali. Here at the South Beach Wine and Food Festival, 17th festival. First, I want to know why is this festival special, or to you, maybe? Well, actually, I've just won the Burger Bash, yes. so I, again, I can't believe it. I lost my voice screaming, so excuse the raspy voice. I'm just trying to be more and more like Rachel Ray every day. <laughs> Well, I think it's just great when you do these events and you work with the students from the school and you see the immediate effect that raising this money so that kids can be educated, so that they can get into the field. I mean, I don't know. How else would you define giving back in a better way? Right. And I think especially chefs, we're such teachers, we're such um, nurturers. Yes, we scream and yell. <laughs> but we also nurture. And I feel like all that directly feeds into what we do and what, it, what this festival creates. It gives opportunity. And every chef got a great opportunity from someone else. So we've got to pay that forward. Totally. So you mentioned you're cooking tonight 800 people at the tribute dinner for oh, Bobby yeah. Flay. Mm -hmm. I know he's a friend of yours. He's being honored. Well, what are you making? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> no one's asked me that. People are just like, are you okay? <laughs> I'm making a, a, actually a vegetable dish. Mm. Because Bobby really is a vegetable man. He's not a salad man. Yeah, if you really look at Bobby Flay's menus, you'll see he has some salads. Because it's good to have, and he likes them. But if you give him his choice, he'll make pasta, he'll make paella, he'll make salad. I mean, he'll make vegetables. Interesting. So he has this wonderful dish at Gato, which is an artichoke, baked with chili oil and quail egg. Sounds insane. And you, you just eat it and sort of savagely without utensils. And I, every time I go to his restaurant, I eat it. And it's just, he knows. You know, he says, are you coming for dinner? I said, if you didn't take the artichoke off the menu, I'll be there. So I was turning around around in my head, how do you cook your own food but honor someone else? So I brought out Bold American Food, his cookbook from 1992. I love this creative direction. And I, well, he's got, I mean, the whole reason I brought out his old cookbook, cookbook is because He's wearing a sweater vest on the on the cover of the book, <laughs> and he looks like he literally stepped out of boy band rehearsals. <laughs> so if that isn't reason enough, so I text him a picture, and he's like, okay, I see what you're doing. So I read through his whole book, and I thought, you know, he makes Southwestern food, but he's really kind of French underneath it all in his, in his approach, and really so am I. So I thought, you know what, there's somewhere where there's a hybrid where... People understand I made the dish, but they understand it's for him. So I'm making his Fresno chili jam out of, out of that book and some pickled chilies that are gonna be dialed down. They're not gonna be super spicy. And then I'm doing like a classic French bistro artichoke heart tossed in a really vibrant sherry vinaigrette with a sunchoke puree and braised sunchokes and chopped up artichoke all mixed into the heart with just a little radicchio. So there's something sweet, there's something bitter, there's something spicy, and I'm putting my heart on a plate. No one describes food how you describe food, and with your raspy morning after Burger Bash champion voice, <laughs> it just captivates me even more. I'm trying to get sultry. Going. This is my yes. next career. I'm doing voiceover. <laughs> you mentioned French, like French roots within there, which was interesting because when I was doing some research on you, I read your time in Europe in Paris. I thought oh, yeah. it was super fascinating. A four-day stage, which is like a culinary internship, if you will, um, turned into four years. It turned into almost six. Was it? But, yeah. But you mentioned there was a time that was a little, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a little nerve-wracking because oh, yeah. you were this female that was that got promoted to a chef and you had 10 cooks under you. Oh, it was terrible. Like as a young chef in a French kitchen. Yeah, I was like really, I don't know, I guess you're, you're never prepared. You know, people say to me, I'm not ready to get pregnant. I'm not ready to get married. I'm not ready to... So we're not ready for things. I really was not ready for that, mostly because of language. Oh. I know you might think I'd say gender and being with all men was the real problem, but it was being American in a French kitchen. And, you know, the French just don't think that much of American cuisine. You can imagine. They're like, oh, Fr America, that, that culinary mecca. So there was definitely the, all these layers to it. Why are you my boss? Who are you? But I did so much cooking. My thought was, you know... If I just cook and cook and cook every day, all day long, and I just 
really learn my craft, then no one can say anything. That's what I thought. Got it. I still think that. So what happened? Or have times changed? I think the approach to our profession has changed a lot. Of course, it always, I think it changes every day. I also think it depends on what you want to do. The sooner people decide exactly how they want to be in the field, the sooner you can start in on how you get there. But I don't think there's any avoiding the 70,000 chicken breasts. You just got to cook them. You got to keep cooking them and it's boring sometimes and it's greasy and it's hot and you can burn yourself and cut yourself and it's, it feels thankless. It really does. There are a lot of moments in a whole day of cooking in a restaurant that feel thankless. It's very interesting. The team that won Burger Bash with me, my chef, Michael Jenkins of many years, my colleague, and actually my boyfriend, Michael Castellan, those were the two Mikes, which the burger was called Two Mikes Burger. So my boyfriend worked for years in a restaurant where he did nothing but cook hamburgers. And we've actually talked about this. He just said, I he's like, how much of my life did I throw away standing in front of a grill cooking all this meat? So last night, we got to the Burger Bash and he said, I'm cooking all the meat. And I said, you don't have to do that. And he said, I want to. And so when we won, I looked at him and I said, all those hamburgers, those thousands and thousands of hamburgers, millions of hamburgers, look what, it, look what happened tonight. And he said, I, he's like, you just never know. It's like in the beginning of Burnt, when Bradley Cooper's shucking his millionth oyster right. and he just crosses it off. That's for him, that little notebook, that moment. He just wanted a moment for himself. And being a chef, there are those amazing moments. And guess what? They're solitary. They're not in front of a million people on TV. They're not even in front of your whole kitchen staff. You just have a moment sometimes where you say, oh my God, I'm gonna check that box and I hope all that work pays off. That's amazing. What was your burger? Oh, we started out super fancy. Because you know, I started to go to your station, but the line was extremely long and I'm like, Dang it. We started out super fussy and chefy. That's yeah. how we started the creative process. You know, like breaded, deep fried Cajun with this, that, and whole kitchen sink stuff. And I think that's how a lot of dishes begin. You know, you're like, we're gonna put beets and tomatoes and apples and bananas. And oh my God, we made a fruit salad. We didn't make a dish. And then it just got kind of simpler and simpler. And then when we got here, Michael, both of them said, well, you know, we're gonna go get some stuff. We, we don't have everything we need. And I thought, oh my God, we have too much. Don't go buy more ingredients. They came back with American cheese and pickles, and they just said, you know, we think in this whole process, we missed that piece of the burger, which is what do you actually want to eat? And is there a correlation? So we, we have this butter bacon jam, which is made with caramelized onions and balsamic vinegar and brown sugar and a lot of black pepper and cayenne. So it's a sweet heat and just applewood smoked bacon cooked down. And then all the bacon fat gets folded into the onions. But it's not super greasy, it's just smoky. And my mouth is watering. <laughs> and when you put that on top of beef, something happens. You know, it's like an, an electric moment. It's electric, and, and by the way, it doesn't always work. You know, I've, I've, I've had a pork chop and I've put a pork jowl on top of it, you know, crispy or duck confit with fried duck on top. And you just say, oh, this is too much. But something happened last night. You know, we seared the meat, we melted the cheese, and then we put that bacon and onion and stuff and the vinegar and, and the pickles and the bun and we just kind of looked at each other and it just thought, you know what? Yeah. So it's a lot of different things. You do TV, you have books, restaurants, you have a daughter, you're here in Miami. What makes being Alex Guarnaschelli hard or difficult? My biggest problem is I want to spend all my time with my daughter. And when I say all my time, I mean literally I don't want to talk to or look at anybody else. I don't know that I... Um, it will ever not feel that way, first of all, even when she's a teenager, she's 10. So that's a really hard to want to be somewhere with someone and not be able to do that. So there's that feeling of sort of, damn, you know? Yeah. I want to be, I've never felt that before. Is the balance thing hard? There isn't any balance. I, I really, I would like someone to call me when they actually find balance. And people talk about how you get to balance. And I guess the problem with balance is, it's so subjective. I think some measure of satisfaction with the way you configure your daily life is the best you can get to in terms of defining balance. I'm so done with that. Come on, people. Yeah, it's like whatever you think balance is, is what it is for you. Yes, for me, I knew my profession had to be my hobby. People are always talking about passion. That's another word, like I'm gonna take passion and balance and I'm gonna table them for five years. Because I think you get passionate when you get good. I don't think you're passionate actually in your fully 
realized form until you're really good at something. And you get good by being really driven about it and being really focused. And if you're driven and focused, your life is unbalanced because you're too focused on one thing. So how do, how do you do that? And it's just like flipping the hourglass back and forth, trying to find which way the sand should go. And you can't stop the sand from moving through the hourglass by running around and moving it around. You just sit there and stare at it and drink coffee and hope for the best. You've experienced highs and lows this Big industry. Ones. Yeah. Can you touch on, I mean, you have butter, which is amazing. You have the Darby, which has closed. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say I only have one restaurant, yeah. and that's kind of weird because all my friends have 500 restaurants. Yeah, oh, people listen in, they're in the industry, you're getting into the industry, yeah. and talk about some highs and lows. Well, I just didn't, I didn't think I'd be on television. I, I didn't set out cooking with that intention. I cooked for many years. I mean, I, uh, I, I cooked for almost a decade before I was ever on television. In fact, maybe 15 years. Yeah, about 15. Then I started to do TV, and you know what? That takes a lot of time. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a privilege to be on television, which I get up every day and I say, let's not forget. But then you get this kind of hybrid career, and I think that happens to a lot of people. I have this restaurant. I've had it for 16 years. Butter's been open for 16 years. That's a long time. Yeah, I mean, when I started working at Butter, we called it, we can't believe it's still open. (laughs) And it's just kind of every year we get up and we're like, all right, I guess, yeah get the band together we're still doing this Lowe's opening a restaurant and closing it that's disappointing I've opened more than one restaurant and I've closed more than one restaurant big highs um, having a restaurant that's like a family and having a group of people that are really into it Um, Lowe's being pregnant and cooking chicken breasts and not feeling good and wanting to hide being pregnant because you don't know how anybody's going to take that being pregnant and eating like you're going to an electric chair party for nine months and working on your feet and saying, you know, hey, wow, I didn't realize how much I'd love a desk job. Picking a profession that I love and still loving cooking and going to a market and feeling psyched about a tomato, a big high. Still feel that way. Still feel super psyched about ingredients and food. Going to bed some nights and saying, what's wrong with me? I've I spent my whole day talking about food and cooking and eating and chewing and thinking about ice cream and cake and I'm so sick of food. Can I get a break? Can I have a juice cleanse for a day? Is it okay with everybody if Alex Gornishelli doesn't feel like eating today? These are real thoughts. Yeah, the struggle's real, but cry me a river and get out a violin. Look at what has happened. What a privilege. I can't believe that Butter won the Burger Bash and I was standing right there and they handed me the trophy and I just thought... I don't believe it. Am I going to convey to everybody that I really don't believe this is happening? Being on a cooking show where that has become iconic, that has been on for over a decade. I go to a restaurant, I take a sip of a glass of water. The whole staff leans in. How is it? (laughs) It's a glass of water. You guys are doing great. Wanting to make people feel good about what they're making and them not being convinced that I'm telling the truth because they've watched me on TV and they've seen me say things aren't good. So they can't believe what I'm saying is true. You know, these are like strange sort of, I'm not whining, I'm not complaining, it's just figuring out your day, figuring out how you wanna make someone feel special or good and having to work your way towards that instead of just saying, hey, you should feel great. Watching a young woman um, cook in the kitchen where I did a dinner the other night, and this is part of the Wine and Food Festival, how nuanced and great these little moments are. I'm watching a 22-year-old woman cook all this food at the restaurant where they're doing regular dinner service and she just looks looks up at me and she's sweaty and she's greasy and she's got, you know, cuts on her fingers and she just looks exhilarated. And I'm like, and I said to her, like, what are you doing? What are you doing, kid? And she said, I've got to do this. This is how you become a chef. And I just kind of, I got chills. And I just said, you're right. I said, just do your time. Do the work. Do your time. Or, or don't. Yeah. And then we'll talk about that another, that's another podcast. What happens if you don't do the work? I don't subscribe to that, but it works for some people. Does it come easy for you to judge? Do you ever feel like you can possibly hurt someone in a way? Yes. Yeah. And I hate that. Yeah. But what's worse is that I cannot help but speak the truth. And then I feel, oh, you know, the truth, you know, those, what's that movie with all the cartoon characters representing the emotions, anger, love, yeah. happiness, joy. So I, we all have all those internal characters. So my truth character is really, really powerful. 
and big. And my um, my filter character that says, "Hey, cool it," is very tiny, and is on stilts, screaming to be heard inside of me. So I just speak the truth, sometimes very candidly, and a lot of that doesn't get make the edit. So sometimes I'll say to somebody like, "Why did you do that? That was lazy." And that's what makes it in the show, which is fine. It's a show. Right. It has to be. I, I get it. Right. But I will have said, you could have done this or this or this. And oh, by the way, you did this and this and these were great. We The whole arc of what any of us judges say never makes the show. And so you watch it and you just say, wow, I should have thought about how this would look if I broke what I said into pieces. And that's sort of an interesting way to, to think about talking to people. Yeah. So I, I read something about like when you were around seven years old, you kind of had no other choice but to cook. Yeah. Explain that. Well, I didn't cook as a child a lot because I watched my mother cook and I watched my father cook. So I was a spectator to the sport of cooking and to the result, which was great flavor. My parents screwed up. They made mistakes. Some dishes weren't good, like any chef. I, I burned a bunch of stuff yesterday. I mean, that never ends. But my mom made French food. My dad made Chinese food. But they're both Italian, so we made, we had Italian food. So I could have a stir-fry from a wok. My mom would make Indian food. We might have samosas. My mom would cook from any number of books she was editing, or she would make something out of Julia Child, or my dad would make spaghetti and meatballs. So there was a lot of different culture was paramount when I was growing up. My parents have such reverence for culture. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing going on in my house except cooking and food and eating. And why I ever thought I'd be anything else, I was just a fool. But I didn't start cooking or become a cook until I was 21. I went to college. I majored in art history. I thought I was going to restore the Sistine Chapel ceiling by myself, uh, panel by panel. That was my goal. And then I just started, uh, I worked for Larry Forgione in a restaurant called An American Place. And hey, those first days, I was a mess. I wiped jalapeno all over my face. I burned a whole tray of cookies. I Everything I did, it was like I would look at it and it would be wrong. You were for Larry, you were for Danielle Boulou. These are like, yeah. Danielle's like this incredible Oh, he's great. French, you can't speak good enough about Danielle, as well as Larry Forgione, who's like the godfather of he's American great. cuisine. Did you learn a ton from them that you still yeah. like utilize to this totally. day? Totally. I worked for Guy Savoie yeah, for oh, yeah. almost seven years in Paris. And he really, he gave me, there's two people that have really worked on my confidence, which is way bigger than the chicken breast. Because you can just sit there and cook the chicken breast every night or the halibut or whatever it is. And that's the repetition and the by rote learning, the physical aspect of cooking. Because it's, it's manual labor cooking. In case we romanticize, lest we forget. It's manual labor. So the mechanics of learning how to be a chef or a cook, that's one piece. The other is, do I deserve to be here? Am I good enough to do this? If I overcook something, should I keep going? All those confidence and emotional issues. You know, Guy Savoie in Paris, he was like, don't pay any attention to anybody, just cook. And that really, and he said it to me. It was like he knew he had to say it to me all the time, he just did. And some days he'd say, hey, you made this dish and it sucks, and you suck, and I'm disappointed, and make it again. And some days he'd say, wow, this is really good. Some days he'd say nothing. When I started doing TV, decades, a decade and a half later, I met Bobby Flay. And he was like, hmm, you really know how to cook. You really know how to talk about food. What's your problem? I would do like these competitions and lose and he'd call me and he'd be like, you didn't put enough salt in your dish? I hear your, your, uh, you know, your banana peel was overcooked. How did he know? How did Bobby know? You know, he's like Darth Vader running the Death Star. <laughs> like he just knows everything. Um, and he said, you got to get it together in your head. So there's hands, heart, and head. It's a lot. What three words would your parents use to describe you? Mm, that, mm. Loquacious, chatty Cathy, hungry. At home, I'm always hungry and um, overworked. I go home, my parents are like, your father and I, my mother says this, I'm an only child, so there's nowhere to hide. My mom's like, your father and I want to talk to you. I'm like, mom, it's a little late for the life talk. The life talk never ends. And she said, your father and I just think you work a little too hard, honey. We'd like to see you, you know, relax. She's like, so where are you going? What are you doing today? I'm like, mom, which is it? You want me to? So, and meanwhile, my parents both work still like dogs. And I'm like, mom, I learned it from watching you. They were cookbook editors, right? Did they critique you? 
My father was a, a history teacher and is now a therapist, and my mother, a cookbook editor. Did they judge me or critique me? Absolutely. If I made something to eat at home, my dad was like, hmm, okay. Your mother and I think it's delicious. My father came to eat at Butter a few years ago, and he goes, you know what? This is really good. No BS. And I was like, Dad, you've been eating my cooking steadily for years. He's like, yeah, but now it's really getting good. Oh, Dad. I definitely want to touch on social impact because as we mentioned, I love watching your Instagram because I feel like I'm looking at the dish live in person, how you describe it. I want you to describe the Guarnaschelli family like dinner to me in detail, but I want you to take me back to the room that night and go through like all five senses. So if I start with like, what did the room look like? I mean, I would pick a very simple dish. I, I would say my, as you mean when I was a kid, right? Yeah. For example, you know, I'm going to pick one dish because the psychology of the experience is burned in my brain. Well, two dishes, but I'm going to pick one my father would make. It's so simple. And I know you're thinking, oh my God, at least it's not mac and cheese. <laughs> mac and cheese needs a break. My dad would always cook rigatoni pasta dry and he would make tomato sauce and meatballs. So he mixes ground beef with just too much garlic and too much parsley. Curly parsley, by the way, not flat leaf. So distinctive and grassy, curly parsley. So he would make these meatballs and he would form them and he would heat a pan so hot, he would burn down the apartment building and he would fry outside of the meatballs until they were like tarred pavement. You know, you know, you ever put your feet on hot pavement when you leave the beach? That's what the exterior of these meatballs felt like on, in my mouth. And then he would boil the sauce for a few minutes. He would cook the sauce for a couple hours. A whole can of tomato paste. A can of tomatoes, no fresh tomatoes. Garlic, again, too much garlic. Like good fellas, don't put too many onions in the sauce. And then he would drop these still pink in the middle meatballs like a hamburger. You know, they weren't fully cooked into the sauce and I would watch sort of those pavement, crispy, burned, brown, not burned, but really almost burned, browned edges and there would be a piece of garlic hanging out and a little garlic, a little parsley leaf like, help, and they would just sink into the sauce. Sometimes he would cook pork sausage and then he would cook the pasta, the rigatoni, in just a giant vat of boiling over salted water and he would toss it all together. The sound of the two spoons in the glass bowl as he tossed it, you know, like when you just toss salad. And he would mix the pasta so much. I would just think, how many times are you gonna toss that pasta? And the, the, every time the pasta went in the air, the, the air around it would just give off this steam of meat and tomato. And I would just, I was so hungry. I could have eaten at a buffet for two hours and come straight to the table and the smell of that and then he would put the pasta on the plate and he would serve me. He decided what I ate, which is something I'm working on in therapy. <laughs> and the pasta would just spread out and the meatball would fall on the plate and he would put a little cheese and I would just, the smell of the cheese and the meat, the taste, it was so hot. We don't talk enough about temperature. It's not just when food tastes good, but when you're cold and you've had a long day and you eat something warm, it could be anything. And it just, it would burn my throat. It would be so hot. And I would chew the beet, and it had so much salt and so much, um, and I hate when people say, I cook with love. I get it, you do. This was just, my dad cooked with hunger. He was hungry. Then he would put it all away, and we would, you know, watch TV, hang out, would I do my homework, and then I would go in the kitchen at like 10 at night, and the sauce had almost set in the bowl, so I would unearth a meatball, almost like a boulder coming out of the moon, and I would eat another meatball. It didn't matter if I was hungry. Standing in the door of the fridge and the kitchen lights were out, like 10, 10.30, I had this ritual. Like, and I would dunk it in the sauce as it came out so it was like saucy. Just eat it between my index and thumb, you know, holding it like a boulder, chewing that meatball. And the garlic and the parsley would have kind of settled in. Oh boy. There it is. Yeah, <laughs> I could eat that every day. Social impact giving back, one of the last things I want to touch on oh, in yeah. a quick speed run, because beyond the plate, this is why we do it. I want to talk about the causes that are important to you. I know you do work with City Harvest and Share Our Strength, Alex's Lemonade. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to pick one or two or three charities, I think, and just kind of give your all your horsepower to those. I used to kind of do a lot of different things, and I just thought, you know, I need to make an impact. 
I, it's my responsibility. So my number one is probably Alex's Lemonade. Um, I heard the story of Alex Scott, and that was it. I just think childhood cancer is something you can we can end. Like a cause with an end. I'm, I am a chef. The halibut has to be in the window because people have to go to the theater. That's what a restaurant is. We've got a pre-theater dinner table, and they need to leave. I kind of feel like we have a cause, and let's make it like a pre-theater dinner table and get something done. Also think that no child should be robbed of the privilege of becoming an adult. It seems absurd. So that was a pretty easy pick. Of course, City Harvest and, and causes like that deal with food and feeding people, share our strength, people that are don't know where their next meal is coming from. Their kids go to public school, and when there's a snow day and those kids are home, they might not eat. Those kinds of thoughts, they just seem sort of like maybe we should get them off the table. Is there a point that you start, like thought you, you need to give back, you need to make an impact for these things? Or? I think we always think that as chefs. It's kind of built into the profession because food and feeding is so nurturing. Um, but yeah, I don't remember a moment, no. I just kind of thought, how about this today? Or how about that tomorrow? Or, And then sometimes my daughter looks at me and says, are you going out again? And I just think, wait a minute. Did I give to the charity of my own child or what? So sometimes I bring her and I mix it together and she's like, this is cool, mom. Hmm, it's interesting. Uh, quick speed round. What did you have for dinner last night was my first question, but... I ate half of a cold hamburger standing at the Butter Booth station at Burger Bash. <laughs> Name a smell in the kitchen you love. Chocolate cooking in the oven, in a convection oven and blowing hot chocolate air all around. Oh, man. Name a smell in the kitchen you hate. Burning veal stock. There's nothing worse than meat stock burning. It's the worst smell on earth. What pisses you off in the kitchen? When something is overcooked or burned, it's the only thing you can't fix. You can't undo overcooking. Anything else you can fix. What makes you happy in the kitchen? Anything that's wrong that I can fix or that I can teach someone else to fix and watch them fix it. Awesome. Okay, so I want to circle back and remind you that you said your parents would say you are loquacious, yeah. hungry. Yes, and overworked. And overworked. I like how you forget that one. How fitting. How would you describe Alex Guarnaschelli? Hmm. That's a hard... No one ever asks me that. <laughs> do I... Do, three words? You could do three words. Dehydrated. Super excited. Hopeful. About everything. Young cooks, the profession, the way food is moving, the excitement we feel in this country about ingredients. Someone said to me the other day, we can't do a farm-to-table restaurant because that's so out. It's so not chic anymore. And I said, is it not chic or is it just expected now so much that it's become part of what we just assume as the baseline for any food service operation? And he said, maybe so. So that makes me really hopeful. But that means we've got a lot of work to do. Thank you, Alex. My pleasure. Quote, I think it's great when you do these events and you work with the students from the school and you see the immediate effect that raising this money so that kids can be educated, so that they can get into the field. How else would you define giving back in a better way? Thanks again to Chef Alex Guarnaschelli. Please find more on her at alexguarnaschelli.com. That's A-L-E-X-G-U-A-R-N A-S-C-H-E-L-L-I dot com. Join us next week when Beyond the Plate presents Just the Plate, a short segment where chefs describe a dish or a recipe that is meaningful to them. Alex is going to walk you step by step how to make chocolate pudding. Quote, I'm going to bring back pudding and make it chic again. Farm to table pudding. I love that quote. You can find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media platforms at On Cappy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on Twitter at BT Play Podcast and Facebook. Season two of Beyond the Plate is presented by Martin's Famous Potato Rolls. Martin's believes in giving back to their community. They support hundreds of charitable organizations such as food banks, after school programs, disaster relief, and others. To learn more about Martin's, please visit their website at potatorolls.com or follow them on social media at Potato Rolls. Martin's, we thank you. This episode was produced by myself, along with Ian Cohen, Joel Yeaton, and Sean Petrosian. Our music has been composed by Goldford. As always, a special shout out to my wife, Katie. Please rate, review, and or subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy, and remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen.